Hi, this is Rahman Sheikh. Welcome to Fortnightly Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. I am the host and railway systems specialist working in this industry for 24 years and counting. This podcast is primarily focused on railway experts who have vast amount of experience and contributed greatly to this amazing industry. This is not a technical seminar, but focuses on feel-good stories, individual journeys, their success and failures, motivating younger generation to kickstart their career in railways and creating a sense of pride for the railway people who devoted their lives on the most environment-friendly public transportation. Our guest for this fortnight is Dr. Tarannam Kazi, famously known as Tara Kazi, Human Factor Specialist at Transport for New South Wales. Tara started her professional career in 2000 as a fellow consultant with Ergonomics Research Group. Tara has done psychology in her graduation and human-centered computer systems as her master's degree, both from University of Sussex and a PhD in human factors with a thesis on driver's level of trust in adaptive cruise control and conceptual models from University of Brunel. Tara brings 21 years of human factors experience to transport. Her expertise promotes safe user experience, robust assurance practices, and drives design innovations. She has worked for a diverse range of clients such as Transport for New South Wales, High Speed 2, Network Rail, Cross Rail, Transport for London and Highways England. Hi Tara, welcome to Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. Thank you for joining and agreeing to spend some time sharing your insights with us. Hello Ramon, thank you for having me. It's it's a pleasure to have you Tara. Uh, I have listened to you many times and you would be an amazing guest to this podcast. So before we start, can you tell me your railway and uh, personal journey story, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, firstly, thank you for having me and it's a pleasure to be here. My personal story is shaped very much by my mother. Where I grew up, she was a working first generation Indian lady and it was quite unheard of, to be honest, at her time. So that really influenced me, that really shaped me. And I guess my introduction or first time I became aware of safety in the workplace was actually from a very young age, was at the age of 14. My father, who is quite entrepreneurial, had bought a house and he decided he was going to do a lot of the building work himself uh, into sort of stubborn fashion. And unfortunately, he did actually didn't apply the best health and safety. You know, it was non-existent for him at the time. And that resulted in a quite a gruesome incident where he ended up severing a limb. And this incident took place in the the house, which actually, uh, to explain, had no stairs because he'd taken up the stairs and there was no floor on the second level, uh, only a plank of wood connecting everybody. So my brother and sister um, went to the site to secure it because uh, he had left. He had obviously been taken in an ambulance and we'd gone to have a look. And as he had departed, he had shut the, the power. Um, my sister and I were walking on this plank of wood, trying to pick up all the tools. And as my brother put the power on, this grinder came sweeping down and missed my sister by inches. And I remember a piece of her hair fell and we saw this grinder just swinging in front of us and we were dodging it, trying not to die. And that was the most traumatic, shocking experience. I feel that really solidified in my mind. Two things. What would... It, to me, it fascinated, like, why would somebody take such a risk and the psychology behind that? And it was because it was such a small tool. My father had really underestimated the health and safety around working at home um, and what that would mean, but also the impact it has on your loved ones when you when you do have those sort of construction risks. So without realising it, that really set me off, I feel, in the very early days of becoming a human factors professional without really knowing that that's the term. And my railway journey really started to the credit of two men, two men in a place of privilege who took a chance on me. Back in the early millennium, I was working in predominantly a highways division and the company we worked for was going through a range of redundancies and I could see the writing on the wall. We hadn't diversified our portfolio. Our client was predominantly highways and our company had also won London Bridge Redevelopment. So it was a, a really big win. And I felt that if I didn't get onto that project, you know, I was probably going to be made redundant. And I remember getting a train down to Chancery Lane 
and meeting with the project managers, imploring on them to use me as the in-house HF specialist, not to hire external HF SMEs. Unfortunately, I couldn't convince the project manager. He was of the opinion that because my CV had no rail background, that he couldn't put me on the project. And I remember being quite despondent, quite deflated. I'd gone back to the hot desk and thought, this is it. I'm going to not have a job in a couple of weeks' time. And unbeknown to me, I was actually sitting next to the managing director, Paul Dolan, at the time. And I remember just feeling, thinking, like, this is it. I'm so desperate. I've got nothing left to lose. Uh, And I took this really deep breath and turned around and started speaking to him. And I should say, the culture at the time, it was very rank and file. It might be flat structure now, but in those days, we didn't speak to people, directors outside our line management. So to even muster up that courage to talk to him was it took a lot of boldness on my part anyway I went back and the following day I got an email from the project director for Lumbridge Redevelopment and that was Dave Darnell and what seems to have transpired was Paul went down that afternoon and spoke to the project team and said you know get me back onto the project and train me in-house so it was really to the courtesy of Paul Donan opening that door for me and Dave Darnell pushing me through And they're the ones who started my journey in railway. So I really do thank them. They took a chance for me. They saw potential. Then I had a fantastic career in railways. You did. You do add a lot of value to the transport industry, Tara. Very interesting story. You know, the way you piled up your personal story, your education and your current profession, three line up pretty well. What an interesting story. You know, as you introduced, uh, we know you are a human factor specialist. In this core competency area of yours, I really want to know what's the definition of ergonomics and human factors and what's the difference between these two? It's a good question. And often that's something that we get asked a lot. And in the most simplest way, human factors is an umbrella term and it encompasses what I would say the mind and the body. So anything to do with the physical body, working space, can I fit, interact with a product or a system environment, that is ergonomics, that's physical body. And anything to do with the mind, cognitive psychology, that's the the sort of human-centered design piece. And that's the combination of the both, mind and body, and the science behind that. Wow. Great answer, Tara. That really clears up a lot of confusion, not just me, but many people out there. In these recent times, in transport industry, human factors has grown its importance. Of course, as the industry started seeing its contribution, that's the human factors contribution, what does a good human factors look like? Yeah, I would say a combination of the both. Uh, The best example has been where human factors has been applied from the beginning to the end. So you start off at concept design and you build upon it layer upon layer as the life cycle grows. Uh, and you work on it from cradle to grave, effectively. And it's looking at both both the physical aspects of a product, a system, but also the, the psychology behind it. And a very good example of that was on Crossrail, where not only did we design the, the control room, the Rumford Route Control Centre, but also the control systems within the control room. We, we had stipulated usability requirements and consistency requirements between the different systems. So we were designing very good human factors integration in the environment, but also in the operational. And that, to me, is a a really good example of uh, when it's done properly. Yeah, that's really some nice, interesting facts about human factors. You know, Tara, the, what I learned before I call you for interview, and I did a bit of study as myself, and I know I work with you pretty closely in a couple of projects. This field of yours, human factors, can be seen to have four main goals. So which I thought is enhancing safety, reducing and managing errors, enhancing comfort, and increasing productivity. But in our rail human factors has grown in importance at an international level, despite its importance. However, supporting literature has been largely restricted to specialist journal publications and technical reports. How do you think we can fix this and make it more available? It's a very good observation. I I must say I'm guilty as a practitioner where 
a lot of my publications have perhaps been in the, the human factors community. I can definitely see improvements can be made in how we integrate and publish within engineering journals, design journals, and also, you know, a lot more podcasts and, and blogging. And we are actually heading that way. We, we do have the Barry Kobe 1402 podcast. Sistra actually have a Human Factors blog by Jamie Barton. So there is definitely a step towards that. Uh, I think the immediate thing we could do is improve how we communicate human factors. I think we do definitely, as practitioners, need to learn to adapt the communication style so we can give the results first and then the process when we're talking to directors and make human factors a lot more palatable to understand by a wide variety of uh, multidisciplinary teams, not just for human factors individuals. And, and for that, we should really enlist the the support of other engineers and other designers. Uh, and that's the a very good example of human factors integration where you then find champions who are non-HF champions actually promoting human factors on your accord. So to me, I think that's really where we can try and focus in terms of explaining and selling human factors going forwards. Brilliant. That's a dazzling answer. I think many people would get benefited out of this and try to actually understand how key and what the role of actually human factors plays in transportation industry, not just railways. So apart from your core competency area, what uh, actually Tara likes and what's Tara's favorite quote? Yeah, I think a few years ago, I would have said Maya Angelou, my favorite quote was, um, you know, people won't necessarily remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. And, and that definitely rang true for me for a very long time. And I would say most recently, perhaps the Michelle Obama quote, which is, if they go low, we go high. Uh, and I, yeah, so I think both of those quotes are quite powerful for me. Yeah, such a nice pick, Tara. Probably this would be my favorite as well from now on. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in the recent times, I heard a talk from you in which you have entered the core competency area of Brené Brown about on vulnerability and shame, which requires a great courage as not many would like to speak about that. It did make me emotional when I heard you. Would you like to share that story on this platform, yes, please? Yes, absolutely. And I appreciate, you know, it's a, a personal story, but I'm, I want to be brave and share it today because I do feel we don't perhaps discuss this in the industry enough in terms of especially women, ethnic minority women in leadership roles. This is not something that is often widely spoken about in terms of the pressures that we perhaps put on ourselves. And I would like people to learn from my lesson. And perhaps if this can reach one person today from your listeners, then it will be worth it. And I guess the topic of shame and vulnerability is definitely one that rings true to me because perhaps a few years ago when I'm I would say when I first arrived to Australia back in 2017, I perhaps wasn't given the best um, onboarding or expectation of what to expect in New South Wales. I'd come from an environment where human factors was very well understood, um, very clear, very bought in, um, very informed on projects to perhaps projects where I was having to explain or sell it quite a lot. Uh, when I got to Australia, but also what I wasn't expecting was the tall poppy syndrome. Uh, and that really took me by surprise. And what I experienced was as a, an ethnic minority leader, I was running a team of human factors professionals. I was not only the human factors lead, I was the human factors ANZ representative for my branch, which was effectively running Australia and New Zealand uh, Asia Pacific human factors, lots of bidding, working full time on projects, working on station upgrade projects, plus um, voting stock projects. So it was a diverse portfolio, plus keeping a team utilized, plus bidding. And this wasn't a few months, this was a few years. And it took a real toll on me. I uh, really drove myself into a workaholic mode and convinced myself that. This is the thing that's going to get me promoted. The more I take on, more accountability and a lot of pressure on myself. And I really did neglect my health. And I remember my body started to change. I started to put on lots of weight. My relationship management skills and my conflict management skills were suffering. I found myself in flight or fight response quite a bit and wasn't really listening to my body. And I ended up um, getting quite sick and in hospital. And then that's when I learned that 
I had become diabetic, but also I had actually gone through menopause prematurely at the age of 40. And I remember being utterly shocked, just absolutely devastated because it was clear I would never be a mother. And the time I thought I was going to eventually have children that had gone, my husband was not going to be a father. And I remember feeling the immense shame and going through a period of vulnerability where I was feeling perhaps not most safe and secure in my organization and workplace because I felt I had to do so much more to prove my worth. There was this period of immense shame where I felt I had caused this to myself, my being, to my husband, and I found it so difficult to accept that I had done this. And it was just earth-shattering. I remember just not being able to Cope with that. I had. Re- I remember reading lots of books, Brené Brown, uh, Adam Grant. Um, but the real game changer came for me was the the Bradbury and the Greaves emotional intelligence book that really answered so many of the questions I had as to how to actually bounce back from this. And I recognised in that time that I had really damaged my brand. I had perhaps garnered a reputation where I wasn't always cool, calm and collected. So I had done a lot of damage to myself. And a part of me was like, give up, go back to the UK. I have no future here in Australia. There's no coming back from this. But I remember the reading and the studies that I had done that in within me, and I spoke about this in my childhood, that there's always been this resilience to bounce back and it comes from an early age. And that kicked in, I guess. And I found myself developing an acronym called GRIP, where for me, G stood for gracefulness, R stood for resilience, I stood for impulse control, and P stood for not taking things personally. And that really helped me get through this period and get myself back on track and really understand that there's always three modes of regulation within us. There's a drive mode, a self-soothing mode, and a, you know, um, a a point where we're trying to drive into uh, going forwards. And that was probably overactive for me and plus the threat mode. So really that self-awareness meant that I could improve my social awareness, my regulation and self-regulation were key. Uh, And that's really what um, changed everything for me, being much more aware of myself, my responses, so that they became responses, not reactions managing my working relationships more effectively and just becoming a leader that can bring out the best in people and being more human centered because people are messy people are complicated you know and um I was listening to Mark Wilde's um interview that you had with him his podcast and I do believe that the future of leaders are going to be human centric and they are going to be the ones who bring out the best and I really look forward to that because just imagine that evolution in leadership and what that could mean in terms of accomplishing the revolution in engineering and design. I really look forward to that day, but it does mean that we all have to work on those skills. It's not just about mastery of technical skills, but it's also understanding that it's not about ego or being right all the time or having it your way. It's about working to the greater good and making sure that we bring out the best in each other And it requires practice of those skill sets to do so. So, yeah, that was definitely a game changer for me looking back now. Wow. Bravo. That's really a great story. That really moved me, Thara. See, uh, you did psychology in your PhD. So you have that background. So the trauma which you went through in your life, the ups and downs you went through your life, probably your academic qualification might have supported it. And you did bounce back and you did pretty well. But my question from that is, did you ever got any support or did you went to any consultation uh, or for the people like you or like me, even me, who didn't have uh, this this academic qualification because I'm a pure engineer and I only deal with missions So for people like me and uh, other male or female or any gender, if they go through your phase, what's your advice? Because not everyone has done psychology. Mm, No, no. Um, True. And I have to say, being a psychologist was probably the worst thing in this phase because I doctors are, you know, don't take their own advice. And I think there was a complacency in my part. So to help those who perhaps may not have um, 
a social background, I would always recommend seeking advice and support from first your organisations. And a lot of organisations now provide EAP services, which are at least six free sessions. They are purely confidential. Uh, seek out to see what your organisations offer and make use of that. I certainly did. And that was definitely a very helpful approach. Alternatively, if you don't feel comfortable doing so, there are life coaches available, but also the most important step I took was to actually go see a GP. And, and this comes back to the mind and the body that if the GP hadn't diagnosed me, if I hadn't found out my test results, that my body was now diabetic and I had gone through menopause, I wouldn't be able to address the psychological, which is the mind. So I'm a, a living embodiment of somebody who was trying to understand what was going on in the mind and the body and addressing that in terms of human factors. So yeah, I would say to get a combination of both medical, seek medical advice if you're, you're feeling not yourself and also a psychological consult, which is often free in the organizations we now work for. Thank you, Tara. That's been a great advice. You know, if you could turn back the time to do one thing, what is that one thing would be? Look, I could sit here and say I'd turn back and change how I entered into Australia and flexed more emotional intelligence skill sets from the outstart. But the reality is I wouldn't change anything, knowing that that means I can't be a mother, my husband can't be a father, because I wouldn't have arrived at this point in my life where I feel I can be an opportunity to help others grow and develop. I wouldn't have had that self-actualization or that moment of realization, that reckoning, as Brené Brown says, where, you know, in order to be somebody who can bring a more human-centered approach to the workplace, I feel I needed to go through those tests, those challenges. Uh, so it makes me a better empath, colleague, peer, and also just a better SME, um, and not get too caught up in work really and get that balance it's essential I would say so probably in reality I wouldn't change anything beautiful answer Tara I can see a leader <laughs> in you what a great leader so you know the other question is we got so many myths in our industry especially in the railways what is the common myth about your job in this industry yeah it's a very good question I feel there's definitely an overwhelming bias that human factors should come at only design stage. Uh, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, my advice is it should be from the beginning to the end. And it doesn't have to be full volume gold plated all the way through. It's layers. Um, and the most important thing is that practitioners develop a com evidence of complexity and understanding of what level of scope is required for HF and, you know, sculpt accordingly. And it's, that does come from that practitioner element where you, can adapt human factors integration on projects. The some are going to vary in complexity, some are going to be low to medium uh, in terms of major projects, and some are actually going to be major. So I think we often see a cookie cutter approach because there is such a, a drive to get projects um, underway and out the door and finished. So definitely I would say a myth is that we only do it at the operational stage or the design stage, but I would say it's all the way through. So that would be something I would like to dispel. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Tara. Uh, before I let you go, I want to ask you one question. Can Is there a, one piece of advice you can share with our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. I would say to any fledgling rail entrepreneur or engineer or specialist, where you can, expose yourself to all the life cycles of a project. I've often seen this rush that people want to get um, high-profile projects on their CVs, perhaps only work at concept stage or reference um, and move on to uh, other projects immediately. But if you can, if your company has been fortunate enough to win the same project but at later stages, say design, moving on to dispose, expose yourself to that because it takes endurance to stay on a project long term and you will see different phases will bring out different skill sets. And just because you've done it that way on that project doesn't mean it's correct. And where you can, absolutely endeavor to work out what lessons learned are on your projects once you finish. Go back and revisit, speak to end users afterwards, receive that information with an open heart, and just understand if those early decisions you've made in those strategies, how were they actually accepted by the end user? Did they work? Did those requirements pan out the way you did? Did that validation produce the confirmation you were looking for 
often we work out sprints or different phases and we move on afterwards not realizing how that project um, operated out or was rolled out and how it landed effectively and it's a good opportunity to always reflect and see what we can take to another project rather than actually recycling perhaps the same same errors that you inadvertently don't realize you're making Wow, what an advice. I would take that, Tara. This is one of the best technical advice I have ever heard on this podcast. It really helps many people out there. Great answer. And I would wholeheartedly take that advice from you. And uh, Tara, once again, thank you. Thank you for being the guest on this podcast. And uh, I strongly believe that people would love listening to your story. Oh, you're too kind. And thank you again. It's been an absolute gift to be here today to share my story. And if it can help and support uh, other ethnic minority leaders, but also uh, those individuals who are in a place of privilege to help others grow and develop. I really hope that people can hold the door open and help others grow and develop in this area because it is a fantastic area to grow in and also means that we can keep Sydney moving. And I think it's going to be a fantastic time going forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. I believe everyone listening to this podcast has got something to take away from today's discussion. If you like this podcast, Please listen, follow and share this podcast within your network. If you believe we should be sharing your story or someone within your network, there is a railway leader who should be here sharing his or her contribution to this industry. Contact me on railwaytransportationsystems at gmail.com. Thank you for your time today. See you next fortnight. Until then, stay safe and take care of yourself.